Hello, I am Martin Kerstin. I'm going to present the paper Bridging the Chasm Between Science and Reality. Let's start with sketching the context. We are developing Morenby, improving it, such that customers can pick it up, include it in their own infrastructure, and build enriched and more powerful products around it, which then are being serviced to end users, which use both the customer infrastructure and may directly interact with the MonoDB database system. In order to improve and to develop such systems, the customer makes a model of the user's behavior, turns it into a benchmark, and that benchmark provides you the measuring point to see how you can improve both the application framework and it can feed back information to us how to improve MonoDB itself. However, despite good interaction with the customer's development group, we should never trust the general impressions because we only see the tip of the iceberg of how MonoDB is being used. What we would like to see is something different. We would like to look inside MonoDB itself to see what's going on both at the customer side, when he's running his benchmarks, and also at the end user side, to have a real view on what's happening in the real world. So we would like to look into this database kernel behavior. However, there's a big stumbling block here. The big stumbling block are these walls. The walls built by the legals, lawyers who forbid any data to be shipped from the users to the customer, or even from the customer to us. So what we have to do somehow is to drill a hole through these walls of legals in order to understand what MonoDB is actually doing. Understanding what's going on inside the database typically requires somehow that you mask the data. Consider a table and a query then the ideal world of a lawyer is that he is maybe willing to share this information with you. Just a very rough structure of a table. You have no clue on the data, you have no clue on the schema, and preferably if you cannot see the queries. The problem is with the database at the right, we cannot do much. We cannot derive insights how we should improve on NDB. So this is not going to work. How are we going to approach it? Well, let's look at the, web, at the infrastructure a little bit deeper. So the customer has a typical stack in which MonoDB plays the role of the OLAP engine. In the past, we already developed a tool called the Stethoscope. The Stethoscope can be attached to any running MonoDB server at any point in time. No preparatory work needs to be done. We developed the stethoscope for one simple reason, to understand the internal parallel behavior of query processing that was called the tomograph model. It seems obvious to use the stethoscope as the basis for a new tool, let's call it Holmes, which helps us to peek through the walls and understand what is going on in the database kernel. The stethoscopes sees sensitive data. Every relational algebra instruction emits at least two events with a lot of details about what is going on. The relational operators being executed, the tables being accessed, the parameters used in the, in the queries, all the details needed to uh, interpret the behavior. However, these traces contain sensitive information, data which may come from the customer's database, or it may expose semantics in terms of relational names. So what we have to do as a first approach is to mask out all that sensitive information. So in the first project with our customer, 
propose to mask out all this information and provide us with at least one sizable trace of an actual running system, a system by users. So we got a trace of 350k records. We dumped it into a MonoDB variation, the embedded version, and we developed a number of SQL scripts to find the key KPIs. And I will show you a few of the lessons we learned from this first experiment. Be aware, this is a very rough approach, so we only have full masking of all the information. So in this trace, we already noticed quite some interesting effects. About 5.5k queries being fired in a 5 minute framework, where 600 concurrent clients being attached to the system. That's great. About 10% of the queries was unique, and we could detect that by looking at the structure of the query plan. So we didn't have any information about the query itself, but we could look at the structure of the plan to detect there were at least 500 unique queries. And one of the queries was at least used 1600 times. With respect to query response time, we see an enormous spread from almost instantaneously to 24 seconds for a single query. Next step, of course, is to look at that most expensive query. What is going on in a query where it takes 24 seconds? Here we have a synopsis of the instructions executed by the kernel for this particular most expensive query. And what we see here is that the query involves a pattern matching operation on a table with about 61 million strings. Although these pattern matching operations can run in parallel, it amounts to about 50% of the total cost of this query. This challenges us to have a deeper look if we could improve our secondary indexing scheme called imprints to also work on strings. The second lesson was looking at the use of the relational algebra operators. We were using TPC-H and here you see the data distribution of all the operators. The join is pretty expensive and you can imagine that we've spent quite some time improving the join processing. However, if we make a similar table now derived from the customer profile, we end up with this table. Join is not anymore the most important operator. It only takes 2.5%. Where's the time going? But pack increment and algebra select. These two operators alone count for 80% of the resources. Intersection operators or object identifier collections was pretty poor. So this gave us a hint to refine the algebra intersect select. So obfuscation so far was very rough. Everything was masked out. So fully masking out the relation or the columns is one step too far. We need at least indication of what tables are being used to assess the storage footprint or how long columns are being used within the database system. So the next step of obfuscation was to use one-way functions. One-way functions are the cornerstone of cryptography and in essence, it's that you multiply a secret against all of the values in such a way that, of course, you can, uh, by inversion, retrieve the original value. So the trick here is that as long as you can keep the secret key not available, you can mask information. The secret key, in our case, can be changed on a session basis. This was the ideal case of lawyers. Full masking doesn't tell us much. But now we are going to transpose it. We are going to use these one-way functions to obfuscate the data. From a lawyer's point of view, we don't see any of the real data. Taking it back to our customer, we asked for a second round and we got a trace of their benchmarking environment. And the query spread time was less complicated. But still, about 800 different queries. This bursty behavior indicates that there's a tremendous amount of Slack resources available that we should spend time on optimizing the database in the spare time between the bursts. To wrap up this project on breaking the wall of lawyers, we can conclude that the customer gave us finally a peak view into the real world what's actually happening in the database system. We were using masking and obfuscation to gain further insights.